Beginning at verse 5, Jesus said this. He said, when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. But when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now Jesus is teaching concerning three disciplines, three basic disciplines that actually were recognized at his time as the disciplines of a religious person. And so Jesus at this point is speaking about charitable deeds, he's speaking about prayer, and he's speaking about fasting. Now, last time we were together and we began to look at chapter 6, I shared with you out of verses 1 through 4 concerning Jesus' teaching on alms or the giving of charitable gifts or charitable deeds. And, and I mentioned to you that the performance of acts of charity were, were simply uh, part of the traits of a person who actually has a relationship with God. I, I was mentioning to you that believers are to be known for doing good. And uh, we're to be known for doing good and not evil because in doing good, we actually are giving evidence uh, of a God who is good and we're bringing glory to this God. I mentioned to you out of chapter 5, verse 16, how Jesus had said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And so part of uh, being a Christian would be uh, being a person who does good things, a person who's known for good works. And, and doing good is not exclusively for those whom we agree with or are even spiritually aligned with. Uh, doing good is simply what believers do because it reveals that we are children of God and this is a God who actually gives. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 10, the Apostle Paul said, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. But I want you to note, he said, let us do good to all, especially those who are believers. But it ought to be the trait of our life that we do good. Why? Because the God that we serve and worship is a God who is good. And we're charitable because the God we serve and worship is one who gave to us. Uh, we love him because he first loved us. We give to him because he first gave to us. It's just a principle that you find in Scripture. Doing good, but doing good to all. Recently, I was in a place called Kurdistan. And I went with a team. I was invited to go with a team to this particular region in northern Iraq. And um, we went with a, a desire to find ways to do good. To do good, especially to the refugees who are pouring into northern Iraq. They have been displaced from their homelands, from their home, um, through the terrorism of ISIS. And so we went into a particular region that is... Um, becoming a place where many of the refugees are uh, finding, finding refuge, finding security 
in some sort. And while we were there, we went with the intent of doing good to those in need. Uh, we met with a woman, for example, actually several women. There was what we would call the matriarch, the mama, and then uh, women who were married to her sons and all. And uh, we met with her in a, a little place, and it's hard to describe. I, I didn't take my phone, I didn't take any pictures because it really isn't wise to do that, even a bit dangerous to do that because if you take pictures and all, there's a geolocator and the people who are monitoring our movements there are gonna be able to find out exactly where we are, are at. And one of the guys that we went with um, was saying to me as we were driving in to this particular area up in Kurdistan, he said to me, we are presently driving into the mouth of Satan. So we were very close to where ISIS is. As a matter of fact, we could look within a few miles and we could see where they are. Where they are. And so as we went into this particular place, we went in knowing that we were driving into a place that, that should the Lord desire not to protect us, was a very dangerous place to be. And so as we were there, we went into this particular village, uh, an area where... Um, and it's difficult again to describe, it's very hot, it was like 116 degrees in the shade, and so I stayed out of the shade, it was too hot. Um, <laughs> but we went into this area that was very, very, very hot, and um, there was a, what I would refer to as a triplex, just to give you a, an idea of a triplex, it's like, we'll say motel rooms, three motel rooms that are hooked together, and uh, y you have to get out of your mind an image of a, of a city, and you have to get more into a rural kind of thing where there's a lot of dirt and, and no asphalt or anything like that, and then you have these three dwelling places that are hooked together like three motel rooms, and each one of those rooms probably are about 200 to 250 square feet. They're rectangular in shape and all. And uh, so you have a total of anywhere from six to 750 square feet. And in the 650 to 700 or whatever square feet, you have 23 people living. And um, so we met with the matriarch and, and daughters, or daughters-in-law really, and uh, she had fled from ISIS, she and her daughters-in-law, and, uh, and we were asking her, what can we do for you? What, how could we be of help? Uh, what, what do you need? And she said, amongst other things, but it, it riveted me when she said, what I want is my husband and my sons back. Because ISIS took them. The last thing she saw was them taking her sons and her husband and putting them in cars and driving away. And it's been months since she's seen her husband or her sons. She has one son who's, who is a, a young teenager who has survived. He's the, one, he's the one who will carry on their lineage, carry on the family name, just as one young boy who was there in the meeting with us also. And so we saw these kinds of things, these kinds of needs. And, and as we were there, I, I had brought some money from our, what we call our church emergency fund because I wanted to use it uh, to help some of those who are in need, even as the Bible says, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. And I wanted to make sure that we, as a, as a ministry, did something tangible. And so I had brought some money to use in that way. And what we did is we helped a young burn victim to receive uh, corrective surgery. There was this young girl, she's 16 years old, and she, um, lives with um, seven, there's, there's actually eight in total, six brothers and sisters, uh, five brothers and sisters and her mom and her dad, and they live in a tent, in a tent city with refugees of multiple thousands there, and uh, they have a tent that they live in, but they don't have, well, it's a tent, so they have outside of the tent in a small kind of a, um, just a small enclosure, they have a single burner kerosene uh, stove, and she was making a meal for the family. I have a picture of the young lady uh, right here. Beautiful, beautiful little girl, 16 years old. And she went out to begin to make a meal for the family, and she was lighting the kerosene stove, and it exploded, and this is what took place. The poor little baby.
she, she's laying on a mat. I have another picture. And this little one here is shooing the flies off of her. It's about um, 95 degrees in there. They have a fan that's trying to keep her cool. She's in such a, such a state. And so what we did is I had brought emergency funds and we asked what is it going to cost to um, do some final repair work on her. And amongst the guys, all of us contributing, and you did, you did, we were able to collect enough money for her to finish her surgeries to repair her injured skin, and that's called doing good in the name of Jesus Christ. She was so touched and so moved by that. I, I, I met a courageous pastor. He's been ministering in an area that is extremely hostile to the gospel of Jesus Christ. One of his members, um, taxi driver, shares, share, would share with, with uh, people about uh, Jesus Christ. And you need to know that you have different groups there. You have the Kurds, you have... Um, some of the Kurds are Christians, um, majority are Muslim. You have the Yazidis who have their own religion. And uh, then you have a portion of, of the people up there in that area who are Christians. And so uh, there are some very radical, radical uh, Muslims. And so this taxi driver, whenever somebody would get in the cab, would share the gospel with the people. And, and uh, this radical Muslim, a radical Muslim, approached him and said, you need to stop speaking about Jesus Christ. You need to stop. And the Christian said, no, um, Jesus gave me uh, salvation and, and it is my responsibility to share with people the good news of the gospel. And the Muslim said to him, this pastor was, was sharing with us about this, he said, and the, the Muslim said, you stop speaking about Jesus or, or you will die. And, and the Christian man said, I'm going to continue speaking about Jesus. And the Muslim pulled out a, a, a weapon and shot him 29 times and killed him on the spot. Killed him on the spot for speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ. That is not an uncommon thing. He is not the only person in this pastor's church who's been killed for proclaiming his faith. The pastor was telling us about how he, he's an evangelical pastor, and he's preaching the gospel, and, and he said that uh, he was building an addition to, the stru to a structure, uh, a second floor, so that he could use it as a church meeting hall, so that people in the village could come and hear the gospel, and uh, he was warned that he needs to stop building this structure, even though it's legal for him to do it. He was warned by radical Muslims uh, against doing it, and they told him, you need to stop building it. He said, and I didn't. I'm good. I need a place to meet with my church. So what the radicals did is they came and they, with dynamite, blew up the, the structure. But he, went, he said, that can't stop me. And he, he built one anyway. And he meets with his church in this particular place. And, and while we were there speaking, we said, what needs do, your, do you have in your church? And he said, well, we have five families in our church that um, have no means of support of any sort. They're, they're refugees who have come in, and uh, they don't have any, any food, he says, and we're trying to find ways to be able to supply because the government is supposed to be helping them but isn't able or hasn't done what needs to be done, he said, and I just was meeting with five of them, and so we asked, what will it cost to feed them? And he said it would cost X amount of dollars, and so what we did again amongst ourselves is we put money together and we gave them enough to feed five families for a year. And so these, this family is going to, they're going to be taken care of. When we were, when we were about to leave, um, we all were, uh, we had the pastor seated in a chair and, and there was a team of us, several pastors, and, and we laid hands on this man and he had said, he goes, I want to preach the gospel. I want to expand. I want to reach the lost. And uh, as he was saying that, uh, prayers were being lifted for him. But my heart was moved 
and, and uh, in, in this way, because even as my friends were praying, Father, expand the borders of this man's ministry. Use him mightily for Jesus Christ. He wants to be used by you. The Holy Spirit was prompting my heart in my prayer, and I said something about, I said, this man, Father, this man just asked to be crucified. Because in that area, they will take you and they will crucify you if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. And this man has asked to be crucified. He has asked in two ways. One is, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. So yes, in the ministry sense, he wants to be totally sold out to you, but there's a very real cost for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we need to understand that. So we prayed for his safety. And so as we we're doing things and ministering there, I need to be careful to, to stay in line with what Scripture teaches. Jesus made it very clear to do a charitable deed. Notice in verse 2, but he said, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do. And so I'm not sounding a trumpet that we might be seen. I'm rejoicing that we as believers can be of help. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 3.27, do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in the power of your hand to do so. And so we had the ability to and had the opportunity to do some very practical things as we were there and uh, to minister in a very practical way. And that's what it's all about, isn't it? And so Jesus is teaching, and he's saying, listen, the earmarks of somebody who loves God uh, in include charitable deeds, but it also includes prayer. And so we're going to look at an outline of prayer right now as we go through our study. And I want to show you a few things here because Jesus is teaching some things related to prayer that I'd like to just lightly touch on as we go through this portion of Scripture. Now I want you to notice something here in verse 5 because Jesus said it like this. He said, when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. And he goes on to say, assuredly I say to you, they have their reward. The attention that they garner from doing doing things outwardly, the attention they get from men is their reward. Because they're doing it to be seen by men, Jesus' point is, is they've received exactly what they want. They're being honored by men. Now, when Jesus is speaking here, I want to begin by saying that he assumes that believers pray. We need to remember that prayer was very much a part of Jewish daily life. As a matter of fact, during the time of Christ, Devout Jews would pray three times a day. They would pray at 9 a.m. at noon and then a third time at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. The psalmist in Psalm 55 verse 17 says it like this, Evening and morning and at noon I will pray and cry aloud and he shall hear my voice. And so at that time they had prayers that would normally be for the devout Jew, uh, normally be exercised three times a day. They had what they called morning and they had evening prayers also. And, and that would be part of what I just was sharing with you. And what they would do there is they would repeat first what was called the Shema. Now the Shema is the most important and ancient statement of faith that the Jews had. It's found in Deuteronomy 6 verse 4 where it simply says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. So they would, they would recite the Shema, they would say that, but they also might pray a, a series of 18 prayers that were basically uh, exercised or prayed for various occasions, 18 prayers. And so faithful Jews would pray all 18 prayers three times a day, but they did it in an abbreviated version. Wherever there was a faithful Jew, when it was time for prayer, they would stop and they would pray. They were celebrating, at first, their ability to call on their God. But as happened so very often, they eventually began to formalize ways to pray. Now, in the formalization of prayers, in, in the writing down of prayers, and the memorization and the reciting of these particular prayers, um, those things, on, on one hand, are actually very useful because it, it teaches the young as well as the old uh, the value of prayer as well as the content of prayer. And so it can be used almost like a catechism, in a sense, to, to teach you these are the things of prayer and this, this is how we pray. There's nothing in and of itself by itself wrong with that. But what happened, as very often is the case even to this day, what was intended for good became corrupted. Over time, there were problems that began to uh, creep into their prayer lives. Prayer, for example, began, began to be a, a religious ritual. They began to recite these prayers that they had memorized. 
and they simply repeated words. And the words became meaningless. They were just speaking without faith, and there was no expectation. They were just reciting words. Also, prayers for every occasion began to evolve. So they began to have certain prayers that were written down, prayer for rain, prayer for a new moon, traveling, good news, bad news. They began to recite these kinds of prayers. Well, in doing so, that replaced the fellowship you're supposed to have with God, a fellowship that is built on, on a longing and a desire to know Him. They began to pray at certain times of the day. And when they began to ritualize that, it actually, it actually corrupted the, the fact that we should have a, a prayer life that is a continuation. It's like when you pray now, it, it's almost like you may be praying when you're driving. I pray when I'm driving all the time. Father, please get that guy off the road. I, I'm in a hurry. <laughs> I pray all the time. But the Bible tells us that we should, uh, according to 1 Thessalonians 5.17, that we should pray without ceasing. It's supposed to be a habit of prayer, a communication with God, not, not a set time. I'll, I'll pray just these three times and these certain ritual prayers, but no, it's a conversation that you have with the Lord that shows that you have communion with Him. Paul in Romans 12, verse 12 said, we're to be rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfast, he says, steadfastly in prayer. As all of this is going on, long prayers came into fashion. And you had what were called the scribes, who were the religious experts, the experts of the law of Moses, and the Pharisees, which were a uh, particular denomination of Jewish faith. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to be well known for their long prayers. And they began to actually, actually sell their prayers. And if you wanted a, a prayer, the more you paid, the longer the prayer. There was a guy by the name of Josephus. He was a Jewish historian. And Josephus said they were known for their long prayers, which they continued sometimes three hours. They might have sold them to rob devout widows by the gifts or salaries they expected from them. So the more you give, the more he'll pray. Well, Jesus said it like this in Matthew 23, verse 14. He said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. Therefore, you will receive greater condemnation. And so they began to actually sell prayers. And they prayed long. And then... With all of this, they began to pray in such a way as to gain attention from other people. Jesus addresses this. Notice he says they loved to be seen while praying. They'd stand on corners, pray in synagogues. So this was their way of gaining attention for open religious practices. And, and Jesus addresses this. He speaks concerning a few things. Three things. I want you to notice this. Notice first, he says, they love to pray standing. They love to pray standing. Uh, many rabbis during the time of Christ taught that the proper way to pray was to pray while standing. So Jesus is addressing that. He said, also, they love to pray in a synagogue. Well, during that time, there were rabbis who said that the most proper place to pray would be a synagogue. But they also, Jesus said, love to pray in the streets. And he says, when they love to pray in the streets, is that at a certain time of the day, if they weren't near a synagogue, they would stop in a street. But the thing is, apparently during that time, they were finding the most congested streets in order to be seen by the most people. So it just so happened that at the hour of prayer, they happened to be in a very busy intersection. And then they would stop and they would do their prayers. And Jesus Christ is saying that's hypocritical. They did it where people would congregate. That gave room for the sin of hypocrisy because Jesus said they love to be seen while praying. They prayed, Jesus says, in this way, in order to be seen by men. Now, their audiences did not detect the hypocrisy. The audience has a tendency of saying, what a holy and religious and righteous person 
because they're not ashamed to take their petitions up before God and they'll do so not only in a synagogue but, but at the hour of prayer, they're there doing it in a proper way and all. And so they, they would see their actions, but the thing is, is that man sees the outside, but God sees the heart. In 1 Samuel 16, 7, the Lord does not see as man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And so he saw the hypocrisy that was taking place there. Now Jesus, of course, I, I should add this, is, is not forbidding us to pray out loud in a prayer meeting or to pray out loud over a meal. He's teaching us to pray to God with sincere hearts. He's not saying that you cannot pray in a prayer meeting. He's saying make sure that your heart is right before God. And that's why he says in verse 6, uh, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who's in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. So the solution to the sin of hypocrisy, he says, go into a room and have time communing with God. That encourages me to have a pure motive. He's not teaching me to ritualize my prayer habit, but he's saying to me, the Father hears me as I go into the secret place. Notice how he says, our Father who is in the secret place will hear us. When he says the secret place, that speaks of what we would call intimate communion. Someone once said, the truest secret place is our hearts, and those praying faithfully will be heard. So God, he says, will answer the prayer of those who pray sincerely and faithfully. Psalm 34, 15 says, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. His ears are open unto their cry. So he says, go in the secret place of your heart, even if it's a physical room that you call your prayer closet or whatever it may be, and take your petitions to the Lord. Have the habit of doing that, and don't be doing it to be seen by men. Notice how he says in verse 7, when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Vain repetitions are prayers that are patterned after pagan religions. The words of these kinds of prayers are used like magic spells, and they're not acceptable to God. The fact is, vain repetition reflects a lack of intimacy and communion with God. And so he says, don't pray like that. Do not use vain, repetitious prayers. God doesn't need you to badger him. So when you speak to him, just be sincere. There are times in your prayer life, and I'm certain that I'm speaking to some who, who have practically understood this, that there's something going on that you're taken to the Lord, but you really don't know exactly what to say. And so you don't go into this prayer closet kind of atmosphere just with a lot of words just rattling from your mouth. There have been times when I have had prayer time with the Lord that was very powerful in the sense of me sensing his presence when I've simply said to the Lord these words, I have said, you know, you know. I, 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 I can't put into words what I'm concerned with, Lord. You know. Now, it's not as if we, we don't make our petitions known to him, but there are times that, that the sincerity of your prayer, you're just letting him know. You're just saying, God, I'm communing with you in a very personal, intimate way, and, and you know the situation. And I'm not going to give you a lot of words. I'm just telling you, Lord, you understand and you know. Ecclesiastes 5.2 says it like this, Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven. You are on earth. So let your words be few. Now notice how he says he knows what we need before we even ask him. He knows. I'm not informing him of something he doesn't know. You know, Lord, I realize that you're looking over an entire world of several billions of people, and, and many of them are lifting up prayers simultaneously. But in the event that you might have a moment for me, I'd like to inform you concerning my condition and what's going on. And by the way, just to save you a hassle, I want you to know the solution I've already come up with, and all I'm going to do is ask you to do that, which you and I both understand is the right thing for this moment. None of us have ever done that. I used to... Uh, 
you know, I had read the Bible, and the Bible had said, I was a brand new Christian, and it said, whatever you ask, ask in my name, and I will do it. And I, I, I had to learn how to pray according to the will of God and how to share my heart with him and, and all. And, and, but the Bible says whatever, and then, then I ask. And I was a brand new believer, and, 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 and I was a single man at that time, and, and a little Christian girl would come into the, to the Bible study, and, and I'd say, well, you said anything. <laughs> in Jesus' name. I claim her to your glory. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. No, we learn to pray according to the will of God in the intimacy of communion, and he knows what you need before you even ask. When I was a little boy, seven, eight years of age, I was going to catechism at that time, and, and our catechism teacher said that God is omniscient, a nice big word that simply means he's all-knowing. God knows everything. And he knows past, present, future simultaneously. And I thought, man. And I'm a seven, eight-year-old little guy, and I'm thinking, that's amazing that the God of this universe knows everything, everything. Now, Jesus just made that very clear. He said to us that God knows what we need before we even ask. And so I would go to bed, and I did this for quite some time, and I... I can still remember saying something like this. God, my teacher told me that you know everything even before I ask. That means that you know what I would ask for if I were to ask it. And seeing that you already know what I would ask for before I ask it, then I'm going to say to you, good night. I did that for months, because I was taught he already knows. So why should I ask? The Bible says to us in Isaiah 65, 24, it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will hear. Well, you see, by praying, when we pray, in reality, we're really instructing ourselves, not informing him. Prayer evidences a sincere faith. Prayer reveals communion. It reveals relationship with God. When you're having a conversation with God, it, it reveals, prayer reveals your love for God and, and, and your awareness of the, the love that he has for you. Prayer reveals humility that you even come to him, and, and prayer also reveals a childlike faith and trust that God is able to provide. Now, when Jesus is speaking here, he's not giving to us a prayer to ritualize, memorize, and repeat mindlessly, though sometimes, unfortunately, that happens. But he's actually giving to us a model. That's why he says, in this manner, therefore pray. In this manner is another way of saying, along these lines. So he's not replacing ritual prayer with another prayer intended to be repeated. What he's doing is he's giving us insight into who we are actually speaking to when we do pray. And notice what he says, and I want to take this apart. I can't give you as thorough a study. I was telling my wife earlier that I could actually make this into probably a 10-week series. And I'm just going to touch on some things very quickly here, so forgive me if it's, if it's brief, but let me give you some basic things. So he says again in verse 9, In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Our Father. Our Father. He's my heavenly Father. He loves me. And I can trust him. He's my father. Many in this room, many in this world cannot say that they had a father that loved them, that provided for them and protected them. It seems to be a growing number. As a matter of fact, it is a growing number of fatherless children. God bless the single mamas who are doing the best that they can. 
It's just a sad situation for the children because daddy doesn't love them. Daddy's not there for them. I prayed for a little boy. He couldn't have been more than six years old, seven years old, many years ago now. He's a young man now, but he was a little boy then. When a mama came walking up with him, beautiful little guy, I still remember a little blonde guy, little guy. And I still remember mama bringing him up and saying, Pastor, can you pray for my son? And I said, of course, what can I pray for? And the little boy's looking at his feet and mama says, well, his father yesterday, his father told him, I don't love you. And when she said that, repeated those words, I'll never forget this little boy's shoulders slumping and his little head going down. And I, I, I took him in my arms and I pulled him to me and I held him and I touched his little head. To this day, my heart breaks for that little boy. I was at a, a men's breakfast many years ago now when a music minister was sharing his songs and leading us in worship. I was teaching at in another fellowship and the music minister stopped and kind of shared a little bit from his heart with the men. And he said, I was six years old. My dad was walking through the front room and um, as he was about to walk out the front door, I asked him, Daddy, where are you going? My father says, oh, I've got to go out for a little while. He said, I said to my dad, can I go with you, Daddy? And my father says, no, son, no. I'll be back in a little while. And he walked out the door, closed the door behind him, and he said, and I never saw my father again. He left the family and left this little boy. When he said that, some of the men in the room began to laugh. They laughed. And I'll never forget this music minister as he looked at us and he shook his head and he said, I guess you're right. I wasn't worth coming home to. And it touched my heart. How many, how many People could say the same kind of thing. My father didn't love me. But you know what? I have a heavenly father. And when my father and my mother forsake me, the psalmist said, you will pick me up. I have a heavenly father. And that's what Jesus is teaching me. He says, our father. The word father, our father speaks of intimacy. It speaks of relationship. Throughout the Bible, when you read your Bible, God is identified, various titles, descriptions, his name. And if you do even a, a, a basic reading of how God is described or identifies himself, you'll see that there are certain words that are translated for us by the word God or, or something similar. Uh, for example, from the very beginning in Scripture, from Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the word God there is the, the Hebrew word Elohim. And, and that's a word that is used about 2,500 times in uh, the Bible, referring to God as a creator and, and the judge. He's also referred to as Adonai, the word Adonai speaks of the Lord or a master. The word Jehovah, though there is a discrepancy as to how to actually pronounce this word, because the Hebrew does not have vowels, and vowels are supplied in the reading, and this is the forbidden name. You're not to use that name and all. So they really don't know whether the name is Jehovah or what it actually really is. But we translate it Jehovah, and it's used 5,321 times. Then you have what are called composite names, Jehovah Elohim, which speaks of the Lord God. You have Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord will provide. You have Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, my healer. Jehovah Nisi, the Lord, my banner. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord, my peace. Jehovah Ra'ah, the Lord, my shepherd. Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord, our righteousness. 
Jehovah Shema, the Lord is there. Jehovah Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts. He's called Al Shaddai, the Almighty God. Al Elyon, the Most High God. Al Olam, the Everlasting God. But the most precious name that he ever gave to us is Father. He's my Father. And that's what Jesus is teaching me. That God is my Father, our Father. Now that's a relationship that those who have been born again can have with him. Those who have not been born again cannot refer to him in that way. It, you're not part of his family. But when you've been born again, you are brought into the family of God, and thus he is your father. As many as received him, to them gave he the power to become sons of God, even unto those who believe on his name. John 1.12 so you are brought into, you are adopted into the family of God, and that's why you can now refer to him as our Father. And he says, who art in heaven, our heavenly Father, hallowed, holy is your name. He is to be holy. He is holy. He is to be reverenced. And, and his name, hallowed be thy name, your character is revealed by your name, and you are to be reverenced because, God, you are holy, and, and we acknowledge that you are holy. And, and when you acknowledge the holiness of God, this is something that's really important for us as Christians. When you acknowledge the holiness of God, it results in us realizing that without him we are nothing, and it actually leads us to confessing our sins, which results in purity of a life. And that produces in us a heart for worship. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, as he who called you is holy, so also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. So your life is not to be lived loosely. You don't go out on Saturday sleeping around or bar hopping and then come and worship him on Sunday. You know, that was, that was what many of us did. That's what I would do. I mean, church for me was a place that I would go to for weddings, but especially for the reception afterwards. So you could drink baptism, same thing. You have the baptism and, uh, of the child, and then you go to your friend's house and you drink. So it was more of an excuse and all. And, and yet if you would have spoken to me, I would have said to you, oh yeah, I'm a Christian. Of course I'm a Christian. I, I just went to a wedding. I just went to a funeral. I just went to a baptism. Of, of course I'm a Christian. But I didn't live a life that, that was, was set apart. The word holy means to be set apart. My life was not set apart because, because I did not belong to God. He was not my father. I was not part of his family, and, and therefore his character was not being revealed in me. I have a grandson. I have two beautiful grandsons. Let me boast for a moment. Forgive me. My Josiah, who is the apple of my eye, all of my babies I love, and I don't want to give one more attention than the other, but I will say this. I have a, a newest addition, my, my grandson, uh, David Aaron, and uh, he looks like his dad. But when, you, when I'm holding him, my son and my daughter-in-law will say this. They say, he really looks like you. And he does. And I like it. <laughs> I like it. I do. If you're a Facebook friend, go to my Facebook page. I have a picture of my Zoe and my David on it. I posted it. And they're seeing their very first fireworks display, and it's just beautiful. But you'll see little, my little David, baby David. Um, I mean, he, he looks like me and, and, and all. And there is a family resemblance. There's a family resemblance. And so you are to, are to have a resemblance to God. And so his character is revealed in you as believers. I hope that makes sense. Your God is holy, undefiled, separate from sin. And that's what you and I are in him. So our lives ought to show that. So that when people look at us, there is enough evidence that we belong to God simply by the way we live. And then when we share why we live this way, it connects. 
And people say, so that's why you're that way, because you've got a relationship with God. You're different. And so our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come. Our desire should be for his rule on planet Earth. And our desire in our prayer should be that that would take place soon. May, may Jesus Christ rule and reign. May he destroy forever the works of Satan. That's the longing of my heart, and I think it's the longing of ours. May God rule, and may the evil end. I'm in a refugee camp. There are no, there's no pavement. It's all dirt. It's very organized. It looks like a neighborhood, 10 by 12 uh, square foot um, tents and all. It's very organized. And, but there's no streets. There's no green belt of any sort. There's nothing to cool you down. You're just in a tent city. And, and as I'm standing and all of these children are, are coming around and, and being communicated with and all, my eye falls upon a, a little girl between two and three years of age. And and she's standing wearing a little sun type dress, and it's 116, like I was saying. It's very hot. She's got some flip flops and a little sun dress. Her hair is is brownish, and her skin is light because she's a Yazidi, and the Yazidis actually um, are very many of them have green eyes and or hazel eyes and light skin. They're, they're very much my coloring, and, and and I see this little this little girl standing by herself on a street where all the kids are somewhere else, but this little girl, two or three, she could be my, one of my granddaughter's age, standing in the middle of a dirt path that's a street, and I'm looking at her, and, and from behind, it could very easily, easily she could pass for my Stella. And the Lord touches my heart. These children, they're out there with nothing, with nothing. And so... The reason that baby is there and is, is because of the evil of this world. It's because people have, have displaced her and her family, and she is now and has been in this camp since she was probably just a, an infant. They, they were in this camp probably up to a year, living in that way in a 10 by 12 foot tent. Little girl, no place to play, no parks, no, no pool, to, even a small pool that you could put her in so she could cool her little body down? If that doesn't anger you about what the enemy has done, I don't know what will. If that doesn't bother you, I don't know what will to see these children without anything. And it's all because of the enemy and sin. May Christ rule, thy will be done. Your kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your will be done. May your will be performed in us. May your will one day be done in all the world. And may our will be submitted to yours. Especially that we might not ask for that which you do not desire us to have. While in northern Iraq, following the news, Supreme Court makes a ruling, several of them that were very questionable, obviously. And Americans get upset. A couple of things I'll say very briefly. I know you got a great, you had a great teaching last week, and I know that that's, I don't have to add to that. Just a thought coming from me to you. Just because the Supreme Court refers to something as marriage doesn't make it marriage. I don't answer to the Supreme Court. I answer to God. I'm under the law of the land, and I'm certainly not going to go out as a habitual felon, but in issues of such as that, that's a question of conscience. And so, of course, I don't agree with that. I was, secondly, I was asked today, are you going to perform marriages? Will this church continue to do so? And the answer is, I'm called by God to do what God calls me to do. 
And should I be asked and should I be able? Of course I'm gonna perform marriages and of course we're gonna make sure that they're biblical marriages. Will you marry a homosexual couple? And the answer is if they're repentant and it's a male and female, yes. But if they're unrepentant males or unrepentant females, the answer as a church, no, of course not. Why, you bigot? Because God said that it's a male and a female, and that is what Scripture teaches, and that's what I do. And so, no, I'm not going to perform homosexual marriages. And... But I also, will, I also want everybody who's hearing this, and this will go out over the air, so I want it to be very clear, that I don't hate sinners. I don't hate homosexuals. I don't even know why they're being separated in the way that they are as a class. God hates all sin. He hates gossip. He hates gluttony. He hates it when we're drunk. All kinds of sin. So I don't see that as a special class. I just see it as people who need Jesus Christ. So the gospel goes out to everyone. That's what it does. And it's not with hatred in my heart at all. It's love because I actually believe in eternity. I believe that there is a God. I believe that there is a heaven. And I believe there is a hell. And I want people to go to heaven. That's why I preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, so that the sinner can be set free from gluttony, from gossip, from lying, from murder, from all those sins you can be set free. And so that's the bottom line. You know, one of the things, and I don't know if this will make sense to you as I say this, but we're not trying to make America into a Christian nation. And you might say, well, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. No, I'll say it again. We are not trying to make America into a Christian nation. We are trying to make Americans into Christians. And there's a difference. There's a difference. We want all men to be saved. And when people come to faith in Christ, that's the answer. The answer isn't going to be found in a new president. You see, I don't worship a president I have a king, and I worship the king, Jesus Christ. And so I look to him for my leadership. And so we need to understand that thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. May God's rule be in our hearts so that this nation changes to follow Jesus Christ. Listen and remember this, that when the gospel was birthed uh, during that day, it, it was birthed in some areas that were very, very sinful. And, and perhaps we forget, I'd remind you, read the book of Ephesians. Read the book of uh, First and Second Corinthians. Read Romans, especially chapters 1, 2, and 3. And you're going to see the, uh, the environment. Uh, look in Acts chapter 17, where the apostle Paul is there in the city of Athens. And his heart is grieved because he sees that the entire city is wholly given over to idolatry. And the Spirit of God begins to move in him. And he begins to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, that, that's what the church was birthed into. We need the power of the Holy Spirit and we need the Word of God working together to cause lives to be transformed so we can be the salt, so that we can be the light in a tasteless and darkened world. And the gospel of Jesus Christ cannot be quenched. The light of God will go forward because God gives us power to do that. We need to understand that. We need to understand that. Hold fast to Him. <laughs> the best is yet to come. God wants to do a work. And so, yes, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Teach us day by day dependence on you. Because, God, you're the only one who can provide everything that we truly need. Day by day, may we learn the secret of contentedness. Keep us from materialism. And keep us from fear that we don't have enough. 
Teach us what you taught Paul, where Paul said, I've learned in whatever state I am to be content. Teach us the secret of contentedness, day by day dependence on you, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now that, that means simply that, that I'm a sinner and I need humility. Forgive me my debt because I owe you a debt. Forgive me. That, that cuts out all opportunity for prideful self-righteousness, making demands on God. I am a debtor to God. I'm a sinner in need of forgiveness, and, and God needs to forgive me of my sin debt. And sometimes we can demand from God what we think he owes us, and we get angry with him when he denies us. But no, he owes me nothing but judgment, but he gives me his grace. But notice, he says, even as we forgive our debtors, we are sinners not deserving his provision, but we do receive his grace. And if I have received his grace, I extend it to others. I'll show you something in just a moment. He goes on and says in verse 13, Do not lead us into temptation. Deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Deliver us from the evil one, Lord. And by the way, Father, help me to not be presumptuous, thinking I'm being led by you, and to enter into an arena that will stumble me where I think you led me there, when in reality, you are saying I ought not to go there. There are guys, for example, how do I illustrate that? There are guys who had drinking problems, they get saved, and then they say, well, God has called me to go back to the bars I used to go to and win them. If you were an alcoholic and you were always in there drinking and getting drunk with your friends, that is not a place for you. And, and uh, under normal circumstances, that is not a place for you. And if you say, well, God is leading me there, it can also be a place where you are stumbled and can fall. So help me to know when you are actually leading me somewhere, Lord, and not to presume that you're leading me simply because I came from a certain background or know a certain thing. Help me not to enter into temptation thinking I'm following your spirit. Now he says again, and we'll conclude with this in verses 14 and 15, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. This is his final instruction here on forgiveness. You see, an unforgiving heart reflects a heart not acquainted with forgiveness. If you truly have received God's grace, then truly give it to others. It's been said no prayers can be heard which do not come from a forgiving heart. When you understand and I under when we understand what great sinners we, we have been and still can be, it produces humility. Be very careful never to fall into the trap of saying things like, I don't understand how they could do that. I do understand how you can do certain things. I do, because I've done them. Because I've done them. So I'm not here to judge anyone. My mom taught me something a long time ago. She said, David, always remember, when you point your finger at somebody, you got three pointing back at yourself. And that's true. That's why I, I always just point my thumb at people. <laughs> or my hand. Never forget that. Who am I? Who are you? Sinners saved by God. God is gracious. And he's loving and he's forgiving. He restores us strengthens us, empowers us, transforms us. He has forgiven us. I was just sharing that with Marie just yesterday. We were talking about forgiveness, and I was saying to her, honey, you've got so much for me to forgive you of. <laughs> You're fortunate that I'm so forgiving. I was saying to her, you know, May God make us, may God fashion us into people who remember who we are. 
may he always remind me not with condemnation, because there is no condemnation for those who are born again, who are in Christ. There's no condemnation. But may I never forget where I came from. May I never forget what it's like, what my life was like without Jesus Christ. May I never forget that. May I never get to the point where I say, I don't understand how you did that. I remember what it's like to wake up in a pool of vomit that I poured on myself. I remember what it's like to be so hungover I didn't even know where I was. To, to do things that I won't repeat. I haven't forgotten. I haven't forgotten the hatred that I had in my heart. I haven't forgotten what I did to my parents and how I treated them and how I treated my sisters and how I embarrassed my family with the things that I did and the way that I was. I haven't forgotten. I never will. And I ask God, please, never let me think that I'm something because I'm not. All I am is a sinner saved by grace. And may I always remember that. And may I love the people that Jesus died for. Help me, Lord, to be forgiving because I can hold a grudge. Oh, I forgive, but I'll never forget. Well, you're not forgiving then, are you? Because God doesn't remind me of my failures. God has made me new in Jesus Christ. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I see. I was that, but I am not that now. But I never want to forget what I was, so I never judge somebody who is where I used to be. And I can be a beacon of light. I can say, look what God can do in a life. If you give your heart to Jesus Christ, again, just yesterday, Marie and I were talking about it, and I was driving with her, and I said, God has been so good to us. He is so good. What a God we worship. What a loving Father we have. Praise you, Jesus, for your goodness to me. Praise you, Jesus.